Right, this is question uh, one of the 2020 scholarship uh, physics exam. Sweet. Right, what do we got? Uh, we have a capacitor, an ideal inductor, a 12 ohm resistor, and uh, and a connected series with 6.5 uh, volts RMS variable frequency power supply. Um, so we've got an LCR circuit or an LRC circuit, whatever you want to call it. Um, first question, state the conditions for resonance in the circuit type, uh, in a circuit of this type, and describe what you could measure to determine when resonance has been reached. Um, so resonance occurs when the reactance of the inductor is equal to the reactance of the capacitor, because the reactant, uh, the, yeah, the reactance of the inductor and capacitor are 180 degrees out of phase. So if you have a phasor diagram, the reactance of the inductor uh, XL uh, normally points upwards. Uh, your resistance is out to the right if you're just going to use your, your like, usual polar rotational coordinates. And then uh, XC lags by 180 degrees. Um, lags XL, and this would just be R. Um, so, I mean, I'm just going to write down XL equals XC, but I'll pause it and write it all out. Um, what could you measure to determine when the re uh, resonance has been reached? Well, you could A, measure the max voltage across the resistor, because that's when when the, when the resonance is reached, there's, you can basically pretend the, res the, the fancy resistance or the reactance of these like don't have any reactance whatsoever to the to the supplier. So current will be max. This is like the easiest thing you can measure. You just measure for max current. But you can also measure for max voltage um, across basically any of the components, to be fair. Um, but normally you'd measure max voltage across a resistance. Anyway, I'll pause it and write it out. Right, so I've just gone ahead and said XL equals XC or XL minus XC equals zero. Um, so reactance of the inductor minus reactance of the capacitor. I mean, the order doesn't matter because I've just put this magnitude sign in just so you know that you, it could be either or. You could have XC minus XL. Um, you measure the current. Mixed current occurs when there is zero net reactance. Um, keyword, net reactance. Um, it's just like a good thing to have in there um, in an LCR circuit. Sweet. Um, if a circuit like this is near, what is it? it is at or near resonance, it's possible for both the inductor RMS voltage and the capacitor RMS voltage to exceed the supply, or is it the RMS voltage of the power supply? Um, explain how this can occur. Oh, it is possible for, yeah, explain how this can occur. Um, right, if you look at your formula sheet, so if we flip over and we find it's going to be in here, V equals IZ. Okay, it's not really. Um, right, so you've got, it's essentially just Ohm's law. V equals IR, but it's also equal to IX. And it could be IXC or IXL, um, depending on whether you're dealing with the capacitor or inductor. And if you want to find the vol voltage across your capacitor or inductor, you literally just times by the reactant, you times the reactance of the capacitor or the inductor by the current. And you can see where I'm probably going with this. If if the reactance of the capacitor or inductor is greater than the resistance, you're going to have a voltage that's higher than the supply um, because the, the voltage across the resistor is going to be equal to the supply because um, it's literally just, you know, the, the, resist, the resistor voltage um, would just be 12 times the current. And in this case, these, oh, hold on, I'll move this up. These here would have essentially no resistance. Um, so you can pretend as almost they don't even exist. Um, well, the, the resistor doesn't really know they exist because they don't add to the circuit um, per se. Um, so, yeah, if you if this resistor determines the current of the whole entire circuit, um, so, yeah, if the re reactances of either of these are higher than the resistance, you're going to get a higher voltage um, than the supply. I hope that makes sense. I'll, I'll pause it and write it out somewhat slightly more coherently. Right, so I've said the voltage across the inductor or capacitor um, is voltage equals I times the reactance of the inductor and conversely for the capacitor as well. Uh, current is constrained by the, res by the resistance because we're assuming it's at or near resonance um, as a reactance or uh, as reactance at or near resonance at or near resonance. Oh, does that make sense? Is negligible. Yeah, that makes sense. I hope, yeah. Um, this, if uh, the reactance of the inductor or XC are greater than R, VL and VC um, will also be greater than VR. Um, note VR equals 6.5 volts because that's the voltage supply up here, um, which equal, yeah, equals the voltage supply when there is no reactance. You can also say that, I mean, the voltages 
of the inductor and the capacitor are out of phase to the supply, so Kirchhoff law doesn't really apply. If you did a vector sum and added them up, um, they would still add to 6.5. But I mean, if you did a vector sum, the inductor, the voltage across the inductor and the voltage across the capacitor will cancel each other out. So I mean, meh. It's kind of a bit of a moot point. Um, right. What do we got? The frequency of the power supply is adjusted while the power supply voltage remains constant at six and a half volts. Uh, the frequency, when the frequency is 134, the current's four amps and the supply frequency is increased. The current changes, but frequency, and the current changes, but at frequency 109, 99 uh, hertz, the current in the circuit again is four amps. None of the components are changed while this occurs. Explain how this is possible to have the same current in the circuit at the two different frequencies. So you could probably plot this if you wanted to. I'll just try and chuck a plot up here. Um, where you have, this is current, um, and this is frequency, um, and you'd have, oh, is it a bell curve? I can't remember what the curve looks like. Something like that. Probably something like that there, like a bell curve. Um, where this would be at max uh, current that would occur. Um, at the higher end, the, what's it, the dominance? Um, higher end, the reactance has more, uh, the inductor has more reactance. Um, so that constrains the circuit, and at the lower end, the capacitor has more reactance, so that constra constrains, the, constrains the circuit. Um, so basically, we know at lower frequencies, it's the capacitor that's going to be dominating. Uh, so I can just check on XC, and at higher frequencies, it's the inductor that's going to be dominating. Um, that's going to have higher reactance. Um, so explain how it's possible we have the same current in, at two different frequencies. Um, I'll, I'll just pause it and write it out. I think I've sort of given away pretty much all there is to know. Um, it's literally just at one end of the frequency spectrum, the inductor has higher reactants, um, and the capacitor has lower reactants, and they add to create the same reactants as at the other was true. So if the capacitor was higher and the inductor was lower. Um, right. Right, so I see the total impedance, Z, is equal to the square root of R squared plus uh, the square root of XL minus XC. I mean, the order doesn't matter. The total reactance, there should be an L, XT. So I've just put XT for X total. Only depends on the vector sum. I mean, it can be argued that f these aren't really vectors because, I mean, they're kind of not. But let's just pretend we didn't hear that. <laughs> um, of XL and XC, because you do the vector math similarly, um, which is uh, which are 180 degrees out of phase, thus at uh, frequency 199 hertz, um, XL is gr uh, smaller. Oh, hold on, wait. Damn it, it's wrong the way. Uh, that's round, round the wrong way. XL should be greater than XC. So XL minus XC is positive reactance. Yeah, cool. Um, and at X at frequency 134, this is what you should kind of double check your answers. XC should be greater than XL. So XC minus XL is equals positive reactance. And they should equal the exact this this positive reactance will be the same value. And I can guarantee I can pretty much guarantee this question down here is going to be finding that reactance. Um, and then trying to find the values for X and C. I mean, L, L and C. Thus, we can see the total impedance Z depends only on the net reactance XT, which has two possibilities. When the uh, XL is less than XC, I mean, it doesn't matter that it's backwards, um, and XC is less than XL. Right, um, cool. So, question D. Calculate the values of the capacitance and inductance in the circuits. So I pretty much just alluded that was probably, probably what we're going to have to do. Um, so, probably what we should do is find the total impedance of the circuit. Um, Z is equal to the voltage um, divided by the current, um, which is equal to, what have we got, 6.5. I'm using primary school divide so I can fit it on my line. 0 0.4, um, I did this on my calculator before, 16.25 uh, ohms. Just a heads up, I do this on pair paper because I wanted to do it really elegantly and using entirely algebra. Um, trying to do it with numbers isn't as elegant. So I've already done this question prior and I took up like three pages because I did a lot of circular logic trying to find the easiest way to answer it. Right, so we've got, uh, oh yeah, resistance is 12 ohms because I'm pretty sure over here it says 12 ohms. Um, yeah, it's 12 ohms, cool. Um, right, so we have, what have we got? Z squared uh, is equal to R squared plus the total reactance squared. 
Um, so what we're going to try and find is xt, total reactants, and that is going to be equal to square root. What have we got? Z squared minus R squared. Um, and that's just, you can put the numbers in yourself. It's 10.957 uh, ohms. Obviously, don't round until the very end. Never round halfway through an answer. Um, right, so I am going to call F dash is going to be equal to 134, so I can keep tabs on things. And then F is going to be equal to 199. Cool. And, oh, what else have we got? What have we got? Right, so I figured out my next step. Um, your, this will have two functions. So this will have a formula to find out what, when it's 134 and a formula to find out when it's 199. Um, so your total reactants, and this is going to be when the inductor is larger than the, uh, the reactance of the inductor is larger than the reactance of the capacitor. So that's going to be equal to omega L minus... Um, 1 over omega C. You can look up omega L and 1 over omega C are just the formula for reactance of inductors uh, and capacitors. Um, and, and what we're going to have, and this omega links back to this frequency. And we're going to have XT again um, is going to be equal to 1 over, so this is where when the capacitance is large, the reactance of the capacitance is larger than the reactance of the inductor, um, I know I'm going to have to use a lower frequencies, a lower frequency. Um, so this is going to be, this is only going to be true when we use the one through four. So we use omega, uh, omega prime, so we can keep tabs on things. I hope you understand what I'm meaning. Minus omega prime L. Um, so this reactance happens when, so this total reactance happens when the reactance the, of the capacitor dominates, and this happens when the uh, the reactance of the inductor dominates. Right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange this formula here for L. Um, and I'll just chuck a wee arrow going down. Right here on my pen. Right, so that is going to be equal to, L is going to be equal to XT minus, uh, what is it, minus? No, plus, plus 1 over omega C, which is that component there. Bracket divided by omega because that's that one there. Um, right, and then I'm going to rearrange for L down here because um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to isolate L from both equations. So set this equation to L, this equation to L, and then I'll equate those two together and then I'll rearrange for C and then I'll be able to find C and then I'll just be able to chuck in C into, I don't know, this question here. Uh, this, oh, I'll be able to chuck into this equation here and it'll spit out L. Um, so now this equation rearranged for L is going to be equal to L is equal to, I would want to move the L onto that side, so it's going to be positive, or is it brackets, 1 over mega dash C um, minus XT bracket divided by mega dash. Right, and we can just side note L is equal to L, um, I mean for brevity. So I'm going to equate these two equations together. So we're going to have combining, combining, uh, right, so I'm going to have, I'll oh, times both sides by something. Yeah, what am I going to do? I'll times, so I'm going to equate the two together, but I'll times both sides by, like, this side, I'll times by omega, and this side, I'll times by omega prime. Basically, I'm going to get rid of the divides and shift the, the omega and omega prime to the other side. Hopefully, you'll know what I mean. So I'm going to have x, t, and then this omega prime would have come over, omega prime plus omega prime over omega c, and this is angular frequency, so I mean, I don't know why I keep on calling it omega, it's just because that's the name of the um, symbol, and then we're going to have over omega prime c minus x, t, omega, um, and then what we can do is we can make this a little bit neater. So we'll pull out some common factors. Um, so I'm going to pull out for this here. You can see I've got the common factor of omega prime. So I'm going to pull that out. Um, no, I don't. Hold up. Now what I'm going to do is instead I'm going to shift this onto this side. So I should have 
uh, x t bracket. So this is going to go into this side, and I'm going to pull out the common factor of x t. So I'm going to have omega prime minus omega bracket. And now that is just going to be equal to, I'll shift this onto this side, and I'll pull out, do I have a common factor I can pull out? Yeah, C, it's on the bottom. Because um, that's what I'm trying to isolate. If I can isolate C, I'll be good. So I should have, is this omega prime? I'm pretty sure this is omega prime. Omega prime on top over omega. Um, minus, oh wait, no, that should just be omega over omega prime. Because that is this one here, because this is the positive side. So I'm skipping like three steps of algebra, just because I'm trying to fit it all in one sheet. If When you do this, you have to use the back pages, surely. Um, so this is going to go to here, and then it's going to be minus this one here. So it's going to be minus omega prime over omega bracket times 1 over C. And that would put that C in the bottom for here. And now you can see that you can just move this C up and move all this underneath. So we have C is equal to, this is going to be diabolical, um, omega over omega prime minus omega prime over omega I don't know why I keep on calling it omega, it's totally not, but anyway, um, divided by x t angular frequency prime minus angular frequency, because that's actually what it is. Right, and 99.9%, .9%, yep, we got it. So that is the algebraic way to do it, um, and then all you need to do, well, you can realize that if you got angular frequency over angular frequency, angular frequency is equal to 2 pi f, um, and you can realize you can knock out the two pi's and you can just call these frequencies. So it's going to be frequency over frequency, or frequency dash. We know that frequency dash is 134. That's why I put the dashes in there so I could track things. Um, and that is going to be equal to, what do we got? Uh, 199 uh, over 134 uh, minus 134 over 199. And that divided by, what was XT? 10.957 bracket, uh, and this is where you have to go, oh, I'll just chuck a 2 pi out, uh, and then we've got 134 um, minus 199 bracket, and let's continue this on, and that is equal to 3.35, 37 times 10 to the negative 5 farads, and oh, we're on 17 minutes. I'll just try and cram the next part in. Uh, L is equal to, let's use this formula up here, um, xt plus 1 over omega c, that should be big C, divided by omega. And if we're using I don't know, omega angular frequency, that is going to be, we're going to use 199 for the frequency. Um, and I'll skip the calculations because I've used heaps of time already. 2.684 times 10 to the negative 2 henrys. Um, and so once you've done this, when this is unrounded, this is unrounded, down the bottom, you'd round up. So you go, L is equal to, and how many SF have we got for everything? One, three, 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 it's probably three for everything, yeah, three. So we need to round up to three SF. So L, we're gonna have 2.68, 2.68 henrys. Oh, whoops, 2.68 times 10 to the negative 2 henrys. And C is going to be equal to uh, 3.54 times 10 to the negative 5 farads. There we go. You could have done this with numbers and it would have made things a little bit easier, but if you do it algebraically, you can see sort of how it can be done. And this would be the way you answer this question every single time. So hopefully it's not bamboozingly confusing.